Hi, my name is Bob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, today I am, I am asking the question, why did our field not get it in 1995? I've got a little graphic there uh, that is taken from a presentation that was given in 1995. But before I go into that, I want to talk about what happened after our October discovery of what we called Gamma at the time. And this is where we were recharging a leaky Chelani cell and we saw uh, up to a tripling of uh, radiation counts in a GM320, I believe it was, uh, uh, Geiger counter. And uh, this was re replicatable, uh, therefore it was science. And when we announced it, Jean-Paul Biberian uh, did a, a replication attempt and actually replicated it within 24 hours. And if you go to the blog, and I will give the link to that Gamma blog in the description of this video, and you look at it, you will see that at the bottom we were flooded with similar observations uh, by other parties in the field. And it dawned on me at that time that uh, there was obviously a plethora of uh, disparate findings in the community, some of which had been published, and that there really wasn't an easy way to grasp all of this data and uh, shortcut the process of learning. So you weren't reinventing the wheel all the time. Well, anyway, at the end of uh, 2013, the UK government, uh, through their Nesta program, uh, had a grant uh, available, and they were asking for uh, 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 world-changing technologies that could be advanced by the use of big data. So I had this proposal that I sent to them in February 2014, and I applied for this grant, and the idea was to put all of the papers I could find, all those from lenacanna.org and all those from other uh, sources that I could find, into a big data software with potentially AI or whatever, um, to enable instant cross-referencing and drilling down into the data. So that wheel did not have to be reinvented. Well, in, on review, Nesta replied to me, and amongst other things that they said when I pushed for a reason as to why we weren't awarded a grant, they said, there is little detail on peer-reviewed literature around this technology. And this was a little bit comical because I was actually referring uh, to a database which had thousands of papers in it. Um, however, they were right to say that many of those hadn't been peer-reviewed, so it's kind of like, okay, Anyway, this brings me to fusion technology, and this is a peer-reviewed publication of the American Nuclear Society. Uh, and this is one that uh, one Takaki Matsumoto published in until the rules were changed in 1994. And it was a letter to the editor in uh, fusion technology, and you can see here that it is uh, the American Nuclear Society. And this was actually in uh, the uh, December issue, 1994. You can see it down the bottom there. And it was a letter written to them on August the 2nd, 1994. And I want to read this because uh, it's a wonderful letter uh, and it's, uh, it touches on several aspects, but it, it also uh, is very understated in a way that uh, Japanese uh, people are very good at. Uh, whilst trying to get their point uh, across. So letter to the editor. Two proposals concerning cold fusion. I would like to make two proposals concerning cold fusion. The first is related to the criteria on which cold fusion papers submitted to fusion technology should be reviewed for publication. First, I would like to summarise some points about the history of cold fusion debate. Since the anomalous effects now termed cold fusion were first announced by Pons, Fleischmann and Jones, that is Stephen E. Jones of Muin Catalyzed Fusion fame, and the same person that put up his hands to destroy the career of uh, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann by uh, effectively uh, forcing the vote uh, in a direction of uh, uh, science by committee. Um, you might know Stephen E. Jones from uh, other subjects uh, related to cold fusion, uh, but we won't talk about that here. Many experiments to prove or disprove the effects have been carried out. 
However, there were very few scientific journals that would accept papers on the topic of cold fusion. And this, this is interesting because uh, this is exactly what I was being told in February 2014, that there was not a lot of peer-reviewed literature around this technology. And essentially uh, what uh, Takaaki Matsumoto is saying here is that the American Nuclear Society in fusion technology was one of the few outlets for researchers in this field. And this is quite important, because, and, and it's very interesting because uh, I actually am saying this. Uh, under these circumstances, the courageous policy of George H. Miley, editor of Fusion Technology, of allowing such papers to be reviewed for possible inclusion in Fusion Technology was significant. His policy should be highly regarded in the history of this new field. And just by the by, I was uh, lucky enough to have uh, George Miley uh, ask me uh, to accept him on uh, LinkedIn yesterday. And uh, so I must be doing something right. Um, but anyway, uh, this is the same George Miley um, uh, who's still very active in the field and has done some seminal work. But he actually set the rules under which uh, Takaaki Matsumoto was able to publish, but something changed. Of course, the discovery of cold fusion itself was very wonderful, and many researchers have made great contributions to develop the development of this field. However, we must not forget that fusion technology was really the only major scientific journal in which papers presenting extraordinary phenomena related to cold fusion could be published. Indeed, other journals routinely returned such papers without any review by the editors. Despite this closed-door attitude, however, the extraordinary phenomena uncovered in this work are now opening the door to a new science. At the beginning, there was no existing database of experimental or theoretical work for reviewers to rely on. Thus, the editorial criterion established for fusion technology reviewers was that such papers could be accepted for publication unless experimental data or methods could be shown to be in error, even if the results could not be explained by conventional theories. This policy overcame the biases forced on reviewers by the negative publicity given cold fusion and the controversy that developed around the Pons Fleischmann experiment. However, now that an extensive database of cold fusion results exists, this preliminary criterion has been superseded, and reviewers are now instructed to apply the same rigorous standards of peer review to cold fusion papers that, uh, as they would to any other paper considered for publication in fusion technology. In keeping with this change, cold fusion papers are no longer segregated in the separate category and published only as technical notes, but appear as any other paper. At the Maui Cold Fusion Conference, I presented the observation of tiny ball lightning-like phenomena in some cold fusion experiments. In nature, ball lightning seems to occur frequently, although I have never personally observed this phenomenon. One attendee at the Maui conference told me that he had seen it in his youth. Extraordinary phenomena associated with ball lightning have not been fully understood since, in my view, some of the cold fusion is involved in the production of tiny ball lightning, it is not surprising that this extraordinary phenomenon has not been explained by conventional theories. We should be ready to confront such confusion. If we continue to reject frank discussions and proposed theories without testing or trying to improve them, we will never be able to fully understand or explain the mechanisms now known as cold fusion. Okay, so it's interesting that he's making these points uh, because uh, after my last uh, analysis of the 2012 paper by um, Edmund Storms and his colleague who is now working on the NASA team, uh, and I established, uh, beyond a doubt in my mind, that potassium-39 was interacting with uh, fluorine-19 to produce the observations that he could not explain, and that he had uh, overlooked or uh, missed the potential for that decay pattern uh, of around 110 minutes, uh, 109 minutes. 
and the fact that there was potassium and fluorine in the uh, mica window, uh, and partly because uh, fluorine has an overlap with the iron in the uh, characteristic X-ray that is um, uh, emitted from iron, uh, it masks the fluorine signal. Um, so it's, it was an honest mistake, but um, it was interesting to note that he, uh, uh, who this is the person, Edmund Storms, who was the person that, uh, of all the cold fusion people that Ken Shoulders knew, uh, he said that he was the most scientific and, and, and uh, you know, had the most confidence in. Well, uh, subsequent to me releasing that analysis uh, on the uh, Condensed Matter Nuclear Science Group, uh, Edmund Storms seemed to say, look, we need to think about cold fusion in a different way. And perhaps it is something related to uh, ball lightning and uh, the work of Ken Shoulders. So that that was very, very refreshing. And uh, so, you know, th there are people out there that are seriously taking a look at the observations that are really mounting up now. But this, this was in the mid 1990s. So I'll go on. The first proposal that I would like to make is to return to the initial criteria for publication in fusion technology of extraordinary phenomena related to cold fusion. Of course, the conventional measurements such as heat, neutron emission and production of tritium and helium now have an extensive experimental database and should undergo the normal rigorous review. However, other aspects Ball lightning being an example, are still in the very preliminary stages of investigation. I believe that in the interests of allowing dissemination of new results, the earlier criteria for evaluating these papers should once again be used, and these papers should be published as technical notes on cold fusion. Thus, I propose that fusion technology utilise these dual criteria until all aspects of cold fusion are cleared up. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, as far as I know, there was no more publication of uh, Takaaki Matsumoto's work uh, in cold fusion in terms of his research work. And I believe that is a crying shame to our community. My second proposal is to start an international project of benchmarking cold fusion experiments. I reported many extraordinary traces on nuclear emulsions in papers submitted to fusion technology, and I feel that these results provide solid experimental evidence of cold fusion. Although these traces of nuclear emulsions show that a new science is involved in cold fusion results, uh, these, this may be because nuclear emulsion techniques are unfamiliar to chemists and fusion scientists, although they are popular with nuclear physicists. Thus, I believe it is important to start an international benchmark project in which several groups in different countries will irradiate nuclear emulsions under the same conditions using identical experimental methods. The nuclear emulsions should be shipped to a common center where the traces were, would be compared. We can expect that not only will traces be found that are similar to those reported in my papers, but new extraordinary traces may be found. If readers are interested in the project, please contact me so that planning for this important international information gathering project can begin. Takaaki Matsumoto, Hokkaido University, Department of Nuclear Engineering. You know, it's a shame that he was writing this at the birth of the real internet, August the 2nd, 1994, because this is basically talking about the intention of the MFMP to find something that's replicatable, uh, that many people can do, and uh, f provide hard evidence of cold fusion. I really would love to have met Takaaki Matsumoto, and I kind of envy those people that did. And again, I can't iterate enough how much of a shame it was that this person's work uh, ceased to be able to be uh, published in fusion technology. And uh, that bites the project at the MFMP in February 2014, when uh, UK's Nesta Grant said, there is little detail on peer-reviewed literature around this technology. So have no doubt in your mind that the efforts of uh, um, Stephen E. Jones and those that uh, really um, brought disrepute to uh, uh, Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischmann in those early days it still reverberates through the decades. Now, he wasn't able to publish here, but he was able to publish in the subsequent 
uh, ICCF. And this is from the International Conference on Cold Fusion, ICCF, uh, that was held in Monte Carlo, Monaco, uh, in 1995. So, as I say, this is uh, 1994, and this is from 1995. And I kind of get the sense that because his one outlet, a serious publication, was uh, um, basically taken away from him, that Takaaki Matsumoto decided to really imbue into this one paper so much um, that when I read it earlier today, I, I simply couldn't grasp the enormity of what is included in this brief paper. And it stands testament to the guy's genius. Okay, so abstract. Experiments on the D DC discharge associated with microsparks were performed in ordinary water. Thin metal wires of palladium, nickel, titanium, iron, cadmium, molybdenum, platinum, and tungsten were used as the electrodes. Numerous sparks appeared on the surface of the electrodes. In high voltage, over 40 volts, and simultaneously, extraordinary phenomena were observed, such as ball lightning-like phenomena. Now, I'm going to skip a few bits and cut to the chase on some of these areas. This paper describes experiments on DC discharges with thin metal wire electrodes in ordinary water, in which microsparks caused extraordinary phenomena, such as ball lightning. Now, the experiment was cold fusion experiments with these aforementioned metals, uh, 0.5 to 2 millimeter diameter, and they were used. They were, the electrodes were vertically immersed in ordinary water mixed with about 1.5 mole per liter of potassium carbonate. Now, what have I said about potassium? I believe that potassium being the second most unstable element after uranium-235 from the primordial nucleides. Uh, and able to put out that 1.331 or whatever it is, uh, high energy beta, is able to take a exotic vacuum object, which may be in the gray state, and uh, the, which may, if it is in the form of condensed cold neutrinos, as apparently concluded by the team at Dubna in their string vortex soliton version of the exotic vacuum object, that interacts with the potassium-40, releasing the high-energy beta, which does a lot of ionization and makes the, um, the EVO active. Uh, of course, you've got a lot of electrons around there as well because uh, you are doing an electrical discharge. So the, the combination of the two uh, is likely to produce uh, uh, exotic vacuum objects in the white state in a 50 mil beaker. The effective lengths of the object uh, objective and reference electrodes are about 3 and 15 millimeters, uh, respectively, with a shorter electrode. The pinch effect of the current working uh, of the current worked effectively to compress hydrogen or oxygen gas. The DC was continuously employed between the electrodes, in which voltage was varied up to about 150 volts under the constant voltage mode. So he's saying that there are compression caused by the electrical pinch effect. And then there's a thing about the curve there, saying that the, the, the hydrogen gas seemed to explosively evolve from the surface of the cathode. Tiny sparks began to appear on the bottom tip of the cathode, and as the voltage increased, the number of tiny sparks increased to eventually cover the whole cathode. In this case, the current was significantly suppressed to stable level of about 0.1 amp. So this is a little bit like Mizuno's work with titanium. However, the sparks appeared on the anode with the current increased with the, with the sparks, blah, blah, blah. Okay, observation of microsparks. The microsparks could sometimes form ring clusters with a diameter of 20 microns. This is exactly what was observed by uh, uh, Ken Shoulders for the kind of scales of one of the quantizations of EVOs and could decay into a black cloud. Okay, so if that was decaying into a black cloud, that does look a lot like the work of Bogdanovich, where, uh, and I've got his paper here, uh, and you can see these kind of black objects here, uh, which he observed in an electrical discharge through water. Um, Furthermore, there were strong bright spots among the microsparks. A corona-like discharge was observed from the bright spot. On the cathode, on the other hand, the pinch effect worked strongly to induce cold fusion reactions and to make 
a bank of clouds evolve with luminescence. And there we go. So these are luminous objects. These are like ball lightning type objects. Emissions of radiations. Radiations were monitored by uh, cesium iodide, thallium doped scintillation spectrometry, uh, spectroscopy, uh, which was placed over the water surface. When the sparks appeared, the counting rate was significantly higher than the background. The energy spectra of the radiations were continuous and declined monotonously as the energy increased, i.e. you have a curve that starts up here and then goes all the way out there. The high energy tail expanded more widely as the voltage increased. The intensity of the radiations dropped sharply as the distance between the detector and the electrodes increased. The radiations were neither gamma rays nor X-rays. The signals were generated by electromagnetic waves picked up with the circuit. So, was the signal that we observed from GS 5.2 actually an EMP from a destroyed uh, Evo? As it blew up, it puts out an EMP. And this would help to explain why the scintilla our scintillator was saturated and why our power monitor went off for a period of time. And the signal that he is describing here, which is basically a smooth curve with no characteristic X-rays, does fit the, the uh, same observation that we had with GS 5.2. You can go and look that up. It's this, called The Signal on the Quantum Heat website. Nuclear transmutation. Several elements were found by electron probe microanalyzer. So this is essentially like WDS or EDS. Uh, um, among deposited materials on the palladium wire, anode, nickel, cather, calcium, titanium, sodium, aluminium, chlorine, cadmium, and iodine. They were not observed in a reference region of the palladium wire, i.e. on the same wire that wasn't affected by the uh, discharge. There weren't these additional elements. Furthermore, a significant, so <laughs> presumably that was also a piece of wire that was actually in the solution. So the old concentration argument uh, is muted somewhat. Furthermore, a significant amount of nickel was detected by X-ray spectroscopy. These elements could not be assigned to impurities, but rather suggested nuclear transmutation during the electro electrical discharges associated with the microsparks. For example, chlorine and cal calcium and nickel could be transmuted by the capture of electrons. A proton and hydroxide with a potassium nucleus, respectively. On the other hand, cadmium and iodine could be transmuted by the capture of a proton and oxygen with a palladium nucleus, respectively. Such captures could occur in the highly compressed state of the hydrogen cluster. Compressed state, ultra-dense hydrogen, but what he is saying that within this highly compressed thing, you also have uh, cadmium uh, and iodine forming from uh, interactions with palladium and hydrogen and oxygen. So he's saying that all of the ions that are available in the system can go into this cluster, this exotic vacuum object, which in 2001 he conceded was likely the same thing that he was observing. Now, I will say something about iodine. This was synthesized in the uh, multi-day test uh, that was conducted with a Marsa gas, where we had palladium, and we obviously had water in there, and so forth. And I, I will walk through that data at some point as, as in the near future as I can, but it supports this observation. And uh, uh, we know that exotic vacuum objects were being uh, synthesized by the uh, uh, cavitation because we saw these tracks, as I said in the previous presentation a, a few days back, uh, emitted from the actual cavitation spots for the first time in history. Okay, decay of microsparks. Many ring clusters were successfully caught on the surface of the iron cathode, as shown in figure four. They decayed to a regularly hexagonal plate within a few days. They decayed to a regularly hexagonal plate within a few days. 
Now let's look at Bogdanovich's paper. Bearing in mind, this is based on work in 1994 that couldn't get published in Fusion Technology. Now look at this paper. This is uh, peer reviewed in Technical Physics 2019. And it is done by Bogdanovich et al. at the National Research Nuclear University, uh, M-E-P-H-I, in Moscow in Russia, okay? And he recorded, so he has a, a, a water stream electrical discharge to a plate. Does it sound familiar? In fact, this sounds pretty much identical to the kind of tests in a way that uh, uh, were being done by Matsumoto, except the configuration is different. You know, you've got the water coming through the middle, you've got the witness plate here, and you have uh, the discharge here, okay? I just want you to read this. I mean, you've got streamer structures here, you've got the different ball, luminous object here, luminous objects flying around here of different intensities, and so on. So here it says, Recording of long-lived plasma, plasma formations. The study of the surface of metallic electrodes that were exposed to these uh, discharge, discharge discovered the presence of luminous spot areas on the surface whose illumination has a fairly long duration, over two days. What does he say here? They decayed to a regularly hexagonal plate within a few days. Wow. This is work in 1994 or even earlier, potentially. And this is work peer-reviewed and done by the Nuclear Institute in Moscow. Here is an example of it, and let's see what their description of it is, is. The shape of the objects is presumably toroidal. The speed of the rotation of the toroid is on the order of 0.5 revolutions per second. Okay, and this is where they can cluster together. This, these structures can cluster together into these crystallite structures that can then, in my view, roll around and rotate around and transverse across uh, 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 metals or other materials and produce a range of tracks. Anyway, what I'm saying is that what was observed and recorded in this uh, ICCF 5, <laughs> ICCF 5 in 1995, um, was what is heralded as like cutting edge research and discovery. No, it, Matsumoto did it already. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's shown in figure five. Well, let's go and have a look at figure five. Let's go and have a look at figure five. That's the current. These are the sparks. Here is not a great image, but these are the toroidal structures. Very, very similar to what you see in Bogdanovich's work with, with these uh, toroidal structures coming off. The, I, I have a video that I will link to where I looked at the previous work of Bogdanovich from the uh, late 2000s or uh, 2000s, where you see these uh, features coming off very similar to what you see here, but in more fidelity here. So let's look at figure five. There we go. Look at that beautiful hexagon. Now, where have we seen that? Well, actually, I think the question is more appropriate. Where haven't we seen it when we've taken a serious look at the aftermath of cold fusion? Wow. Decay product of the ring cluster. Hmm. Due credit to Takaaki Matsumoto, really. Why was this man's work not published more? Okay. The ring and hexagonal products were examined with EPMA, uh, which obtained a two-dimensional distribution of elements around the products. Besides iron of the host metal and potassium of the electrolyte, some elements of calcium, sodium, chlorine, and cadmium were observed both in the ring and the hexagonal products. In particular, Two circular zones that were seen for cadmium were clearly separated from each other. In the ring products, as shown in figure six, let's see if we can actually see anything in figure six. Uh, it's probably not good enough. Okay, uh, this is figure six. Cadmium distribution in the ring cluster. Okay, so yeah, so I guess there's, there's this ring here, which is a toroid, and then there's one on the outside, and so there's a black area in between, okay? Uh, oh, no, I've gone too far. I've gone miles away now. 
okay. In the ring products, as shown in figure six, those observations suggested that the ring product could consist of the hydrogen cluster, ultra dense hydrogen cluster, and that the process of the nuclear transmutation took place in the clusters or during the formation of the clusters. I don't know how clear he could have been in 1995. It is a great shame that this guy, this guy's work was not better supported and that he, people did not hear his previous call as presented in Fusion Technology to take his simple experiments and explore the observations that you can see on witness materials. Nuclear emulsions. The nuclear emulsions were placed to monitor particles that were emitted during the electrical discharge. Extraordinary rail-like traces were observed on the surface of the first nuclear emulsion. Now, I've done a video where it seems to be clear that Takaaki Matsumoto was the first to record strange radiation type traces. The traces suggested one-touch printing that was caused by some particles walking around on the surface. Bogdanovich is saying here, the stream of electrons from the dielectric surface and complex object of the type of luminous rings that is formed by it, rotating around its own common axis and rolling on the surface. The diameter of the ring was about 10 micrometers. Actually, if you look at the graphic, it, it is uh, uh, the radius. And sometimes I, I've even made this mistake myself. He actually means radius. So, and he actually reaffirms the mistake here by saying approximately the same as that of the ring clusters observed on the iron electrodes, which we know is 20 microns. <laughs> so anyway, um, this observation suggests an extraordinarily extraordinary result that the ring product could penetrate the glass wall of the cell and the water region. Those curious behaviors of the ring product were previously reported and were very similar to the ball lightning phenomena in the natural environment, i.e. ball lightning can sometimes go through glass. And in this case, it's gone through glass. In another experiment uh, uh, or presentation that I will give hopefully this week, I will talk about a number of cases and where, where I believe it can go through the glass and where it can't go through the glass and the reasons why. But if you know where I'm going with this, you can probably already work it out. But anyway, the mechanisms of extraordinary penetration could be caused by the itonic state of the cluster. This is the kind of like watered down version of the dead one of these okay um so you, you end up with a, a track and but he's saying that the 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 structure this type of it's born from electrons uh, is it electrons is it sub electrons but whatever it is a cluster it's held together by this mesh and he calls this thing the itonic cluster but the details are not clear now other types of extraordinary traces were observed on the nuclear emulsions, such as bacteria-like trace, as shown in figure seven. It was very similar to that observed in previous experiments of pulse discharge in water. This is where the exotic vacuum objects start to cluster together into things that increasingly look like organic forms. Okay, miscellaneous. Other extraordinary phenomena were observed during or after the discharge experiments. The first was the formation of string products, which is, was observed with SEM on the surface of the palladium cathode after discharges. The analysis with EDX indicated that there were only potassium elements in the string products. So what is causing a huge string of potassium type th uh, element to join together? Could this be like a whole load of highly magnetic evos which are, contain essentially a lot of potassium because the potassium is being captured out of the water and the, the, they form these magnetic strings of potassium i the, the, there's ultra dense hydrogen in there so it's like a it's like a some type of dense hydrogen it's magnetic it's in these clusters which we know to exist for a long period of time and then the potassium somehow is linked into these string products. Um, similar string products were observed with VTR system during the discharges. Well, could that be like the string products we see here in the work of Bogdanovich? 
Hmm, maybe. Um, the second was the formation of film products, which you observe with the VTR system. The film products were formed on the bottom portion of the cathode where the microsparks were frequently used, uh, generated. The third was the magnetization of the platinum wires. We know platinum is not magnetic, okay? 0.5 millimeters diameter, which were used as the leading wires. The magnetization effect was noticed at the tip of the platinum wires in which the electrodes were connected. The magnetization could be related to the formation of the ring cluster in which the closed current flows to induce the magnetic field. Now, I did say that this week I would be focusing on magnetic aspects of exotic vacuum objects. Here we have, in 1995, Takaaki Matsumoto closing out his paper for ICCF5 that platinum was observed to be mag made magnetic and that the reason is potentially because these ring clusters, these exotic vacuum object toroids, produce a magnetic uh, field. And he uh, posits that that is because they have a closed current, which is continually flowing. And we know that from his work, it took several days. And from this work, it's still operating for several days. And we have seen that these things can be moved around with magnetic fields. And wherever else have we seen this? Well, in Hutchison effect, non-magnetic materials were becoming magnetic as well as transmutation. The same major observations as observed by Takaaki Matsumoto. So there you have it. Matsumoto tried nicely to beg the lead editor of the American News Nuclear Society uh, paper uh, journal Fusion Technology to allow his work to be presented. But to the best of my knowledge, Nothing happened after the end of 1993, maybe something in 94, but I think it was like 93. He was begging in August 1994. He'd already presented earlier that year. And so in this one paper here, you have ultra-dense hydrogen. You have ultra-dense basically anything. You have transmutation inside. You have ball lightning. You have toroidal structures. You have potassium carbonate. Notice the potassium could contain, will always contain potassium 40. The carbonate, the carbon in there could contain carbon 14, depending on how it was synthesized. It, you know, it could be synthesized maybe from potash, but it could be a, a different source where the carbon is dead. The structures he observed were in line with the structures we have observed on uh, Hutchison samples. And uh, the claims of, uh, of observations and in SEMs and so forth of Kenneth Shoulders and of other authors. The same kind of structures we've seen in the line reactor. The same kind of structures we've seen uh, as damage marks from Omaza vibrator system, which we know does cavitation, which we know produces exotic vacuum object uh, tracks. Um, and uh, ball lightning effects here. And he is... Re recounting something here, which is almost exactly what we observed in uh, Signal with GS 5.2, which I have said for a long time is likely to be a, a, a blowing up exotic vacuum object and producing effectively an EMP that did the work. And this was something that was warned by uh, 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 shoulders would happen. And you have the nuclear transmutation, and we have observed the production of iodine uh, in data that I will share from uh, the tests of the Amaza vibrator plate. So similar synthesis uh, in a situation where we know in both cases there are exotic vacuum objects. And uh, this is just absolutely stunning. The decay over a number of days matching the work of Bogdanovich et al. in Moscow uh, of these toroidal structures to a hexagonal plate and the distribution of elements in there only being elements that could have been synthesized in a process that collected ions as it traveled, as observed by Shishkin et al. Uh, at Dubna Science City in, since 2009 with their long uh, and well-organized well, well -organized research program where 
uh, string vortex solitons can capture ions of any type, and the ions can be characterized by looking at the depths uh, and widths of the pits they leave in photographic emulsion. Rail-like traces, exactly like, and he even describes the way they could have, could have been formed. And then uh, connects it again to uh, ball lightning. And then down here, we have uh, uh, string-like uh, structures being left on, on the material. And lastly, the magnetization of non-magnetic materials. Thank you very much for your time watching this. As always, I will try to put all of the um, references to the things that I've talked about in this video so you can go and check them for yourself. But I fail to see why, why this field did not understand what is going on in 1995. And I hope in the coming weeks it will become so blindingly obvious what is going on. And people can start actually just knowing what they're doing and producing data. And from knowing how it works, we can progress to making technology from this and using it to benefit mankind. So thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.